this is Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and Caroline's not able to be with us today, but we do have, as always, a wonderful guest. Our guest today is Brian E. Robinson. He's the author of 35 nonfiction books and two novels, although somewhere I think I saw three novels, so we're going to have to ask about that. His books have been translated into 13 languages, and he's been featured on 2020, Good Morning America, and many other shows. Robinson maintains a private psychotherapy practice and lives in the Blue Ridge Mountains with his spouse and four dogs. Uh, his website is brianrobinsonbooks.com. That's Brian with a Y. And the book we're talking about today is Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Brian. Thank you, Monica. It's great to be here. All right, so let's clear this up. Is it two or three novels? Well, it's finished, and I've started on the third. Okay, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, um... Nonfiction and and novel writing, um, right. and it sounds like a lot of articles and essays and all kinds of things. Is that true? Now, I used to do technical writing, and I've written self help books, and I did a lot of academic writing when I taught at the University of North Carolina. Well, I've been pretty much all over the place with my writing. <laughs> did you always want to be a writer, Brian? You know what? I wanted to write from the time I was eight years old when I lived in a crazy household. I'm probably the only one right now in listening who um, came from a a dysfunctional family but oh I'm sure (laughs) uh, my life and uh, and I've been writing ever since Uh, I would when I was a kid I would uh, write these mysteries (coughs) excuse me and uh, I'd get these little characters into trouble and I'd get them out of trouble and it gave me a, an immense sense of control over something I really didn't have any control over. Mm. I fell in love with writing. It's, uh, it's like ink is in my blood. And um, so I've written my whole life, and it's something I continue to do pretty much every day. Now, is this book the first one that's aimed at writers? Yes, it is. Yeah. And what, what made you decide to do this book? Well, uh like most of, or much of my writing, it came from my painful experience of uh, my second novel. I hit writer's block, and um, I was struggling, struggling. And one of the things I do is I, I bring all of my, I'm a psychotherapist. I bring all my psychological principles to pretty much everything I do. And I, I happen to know that one of the things that we don't do is push, uh, even though a lot of people do push. You know, if you're in a... Let's say if you're stuck in a riptide, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been in one, I have, it's, it's horrifying. It will kill you if you keep trying to swim to shore. The key is to relax and swim parallel and you come in. So there's a similar theme in psychology where uh, instead of pushing, sometimes we just take a breath and step back. And so that's what I did from the mm-hmm. writer's block. And I started looking around and I couldn't find, there are tons of books as many of you know, on craft, but really couldn't find much on, so what do you do when you have self-doubt or when you feel defeated or when you are are so frustrated you can't even sit down at your workstation? And so I started writing uh, some thoughts based on my vast experience in life. And uh, it started forming into a daily meditation book uh, t- to overcome obstacles. And one of the things that everybody has been saying since the book was released about two weeks ago is this book's for anybody, not just writers, but it's it's facing life and not letting life, the obstacles that are thrown at us, keep us down. Uh, in, instead of feeling defeat, the book is about how you cultivate resilience and make it through whatever life throws. So what I did... As I, I wrote this book, and then I went back and finished the novel, and it's now with my agent, and so I had two books to boot. Oh, awesome. That's what happened. <laughs> it's funny because resilience maybe isn't a word that we associate with writing necessarily. It, it isn't, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, because there's nothing out there. Uh, you know, I, I, I was in a workshop, and there, w- there was a literary agent, and she said, what do you think the most important uh, quality a successful writer needs? And folks were saying the ability to write and 
you know, all this crap. And she said, the number one is resilience. Because if you don't have that, you'll never make it. And and that triggered also my ideas to, you know, put this book in action. And it's true. If we look at the some of the successful writers, like, oh, Janet Ivanovich uh, talks about uh, her rejection. She had a whole shoebox full. And once it was full, took uh, the box to the curb in front of her house and set it on fire, which was kind of a uh, a signal for her to say, you know, you're not going to get me. I'm going to get you. <laughs> Stephen King talks about a nail that he put all his rejection slips on, and then once the nail was full, he replaced it with a spike because they kept on coming. <laughs> that, that's the sign of a resilient writer. And nobody talks about this. I know the chicken uh, soup for the soul writers had, I can't remember, like 140 rejections or something like that before they found a publisher. Right. It's amazing. Right. Steve Barry talks about uh, 85 rejections and 12 years before he got his first novel. In a way, it's good to hear this because uh, new writers especially, I worked a lot with the debut writers at International Thriller Writers. I was the coordinator for the uh, online program that we had to you know, give them support. And it was amazing how many of them were suffering of second book syndrome because they thought the second one has to be better and how am I going to do it? And it's amazing how many writers have self-doubt and uh, think that, you know, you get a rejection and it's over. But the truth is what we're, what we know is just part of the, it's part of the path. So expect rejection. Just Step around it, keep on going, don't let it get you down. You, you call it a package deal, acceptance and rejection, or a package Absolutely. deal as a writer. Absolutely. You cannot have, a, a, I don't know of anybody who has had, a, and I know a lot of well-known writers, a successful writing career without rejection. I, I, I don't think it's, it's possible, really. And, you know, if we look at, on the physical level, this is what I love about uh, com- you know, looking at the psychology and physics of writing, grass grows through concrete. Now think about that. Grass grows through concrete. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and in psychology, we, th- there's some cutting edge research in neuroscience. We know that everybody on this planet has a resilient zone that they're born with. And we're starting to discover how to reach it and, and how to um, expand it. Uh, but many of us don't even know that, you know. And the only way we're going to find out is to be tested. And that's what life does, if you're willing to look at it that way. And it can make us stronger. Mm. Well, that's for sure. What, what about, though, I mean, <laughs> there are some people who are writers who write who their material isn't really publishable. Yeah. So how, and if they keep trying and trying and trying, I mean, how do you know when it's time to actually move on to something else? Well, (laughs) here again, I will say without naming anybody, uh, a lot of famous writers will say their first writing was not publishable, but they didn't give up. So, uh, that's really a good question because uh, when we get rejected, sometimes there's good reason for it. The key is if you have ink in your blood, if you really love writing, and that needs to be the fundamental motivation for all of us, if you really love it, then you do need the craft. I mean, uh, whether it's a, a writing class or a, a degree in creative writing or your your book tribe, the people that you know you share your writing with, we, we all need some kind of support, and we need training. Um, so if, if it's unpublishable, and if you really want to be a writer, don't do what so many people I've seen do and just publish it yourself and throw it out there and it dies on the shelf. Um, you've got to keep working at it. It's a craft. And, and so the key is if you really want to, want to write, you have to, you have to work at it. You have to it. learn, you, and you can get better. You're, Absolutely. Yeah. Get better if you love it and if you're willing to stay in there and not get impatient or frustrated and just keep on plugging away. The problem is some people that I've seen um, beginning writers, they just they they won't take any feedback. They think every word they wrote was yeah. perfect. And yeah, right. <laughs> you've seen that, too. 
Oh, I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> but what we have to realize, you know, who said it? Uh, not Steinbeck. It was, uh, I can't remember, but Kill Our Little Darling. Yes, yes. We have to get to the point that just because we think we've written something great, that doesn't mean our editor or the public is going to see it that way. And that's something we have to learn. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who has just written the first novel, and he thought it was fabulous. And he had an editor look at it, and she just ripped it apart. And he was shocked because he said, I thought this was wonderful. But um, but that's how we learn. We start to get a wider perspective uh, from other people's uh, point of view, and we need many eyes on a manuscript if, if we want it to do well. Then on the other hand, sometimes you give it to somebody who's ripping it apart, but they're not right necessarily either. Right. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> it, it can be a very subjective kind of thing. And um, uh, I, I can't remember how many times uh, Pot, uh, per, Harry Potter was, the whole idea was rejected. Mm. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the most famous books that, that we've read, um, because it, you know, I think a lot of these editors are afraid of us because they'll send us these rejection letters that say, I'm afraid this is just not right for us, or <laughs> can't use this. Or, um, but that's the other thing, that, uh, keeping the, that perspective that you just uh, brought up of, some things need work, and, and sometimes if we really love something and we really believe in it, we have to be able to decide what to keep and what to listen to and change. And sometimes it can be confusing and a slippery slope, but that's what, the better you get, the clearer you are on that. But that's that's why it's so good to have your writing tribe. Right, and if and if Trust. if you get three, four people all saying the same thing, then maybe you really listen to it. Um, yeah, I call that a reality check. Yeah, three different yeah. people who don't know each other say similar things. That that's what you want to go with. Right, right. On the other hand, I I've known writers who were actually pretty darn good, and they would get you know get a manuscript, send it out, get feedback, revise it, send it to somebody else, get feedback, revise it, send it out, give it somebody else to give feedback, and and it was like a continual. Loop because it was never going uh, to be perfect. <laughs> I was teasing when I said that, but yeah, um, <laughs> that's uh, uh, sometimes that's the you know the agony that we just have to go through and keep plugging away and not give up. Yeah, but sometimes too, it's it's like there's a point where you're not going to please everybody. Um, so at some point you're done, right? Sometimes when when you're finished with a manuscript, do you feel like it's as good as you can possibly make it, or do you feel like, well, if I had more time, I could keep revising? Well, I usually get to a place where I feel like you know it's it's cooked, it's it's done. But then if I give it to my agent and my agent looks at it and says, "What about this or what about that?" It widens my perspective, and I can say, "Oh yeah, that is going to make it even better." And then it gets to the publisher, and the editor might say, well, what if you did this or that? I don't. Uh, I, I think we have to be true to ourselves and not compromise as a writer, but we also have to keep our ears open to feedback from people who are trying to help us out. You know, one of the, to me, the death knell for a writer is to be so closed that you're not willing to take feedback and, and look uh, objectively at your work. Absolutely. You don't want to compromise yourself either. And that's a difficult balance to find. Yes, it sure is. Yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices. But I think that's, learned. that's part of learning as a writer. Oh, absolutely. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Brian Robinson, author of Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers, and that is, uh, Brian is a um, doctor, Ph.D., and uh, how do you, I mean, 35 nonfiction books, you're on your third novel, it sounds like you have a full-time psychotherapy practice. How do you fit all that in? Well, actually, I don't have a full-time psychotherapy practice. I, I'm in my okay. therapy office on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and half days, Thursdays. Okay, so half time. Day, uh, <laughs> I write. But I actually write even on the days that I go to my office. Uh, even if it's five or ten minutes, because that's what a writer does. 
if, if you're a school teacher, you go to teach, and if you, uh, Monica, you you have you go to work, I assume every day. Yep. So writing is not something you do when you feel like it, or when the mood strikes, or when you have nothing better to do. It's something we do every day if you are a writer. And um, but so I I keep a pretty good balance. I've written another book I wrote that probably is my biggest seller is Chained to the Desk about balance and so forth. Um, and I keep a pretty good balance. I've learned to do that, again, through my own painful life experiences <laughs> of having been a workaholic and ah. not keeping the balance. But but who was it? Was it um, Hemingway who said something about, you know, the key to it's, it's sort of butt and chair? There was some, some famous writer oh, who said that. Was, uh, oh, I quote her in my book. In my, she's one of the... Um, writers at, at the beginning of one of my writers ah. daily readings it's a woman but i can't i can't remember who it is <laughs> well let's talk a little bit about about the structure of the book because i found it really um fun um you each well, it's a 365 so it's by the day although you can start at any point in the in the year and circle back around you don't have to start on january 1st um and if you're feeling defeat one day or doubt or uh, if you're really down, you can go into the glossary and there'll be several readings on different moods or different feelings or different situations. And then you can go directly to those. And um, so there are lots of ways you can use the book to your advantage. And each page has a quote from a writer and has um, a few paragraphs there. Each pa- each day is one page and uh, you know, several paragraphs about the topic and then a, a summary in the takeaway. And the takeaway is um, kind of almost a to-do sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a little, uh, uh, it's kind of a summary, but something you can do and kind of follow away in the back of your mind and carry with you throughout your writing day. Right. Uh, so let's say... I was looking at April 17th earlier. Uh, it's called Outlast Defeat. <laughs> that is so funny because that's the one I have up on my screen. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's it. That is. Uh, can I read the quote? By... Yes. And in fact, why don't you read the whole page for us? Okay. I'll be glad to. Great. So this is April 17th, and it's called Outlast Defeat. Uh, and this is what my Angela said. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats. So you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. And here's the reading. If we fall short of our goals, no matter how unreasonable they might be, how many of us torture ourselves with self-defeat? How often do we put ourselves down for innocent mistakes or the risk of putting ourselves out there and failing? Instead of scolding ourselves, we outlast defeat by giving ourselves credit for our grand efforts. Success and defeat are a package deal, and nowhere are feelings of defeat more pervasive than in the writing and publishing world. Writing defeats give us a chance to know ourselves better and hone our resilience. We learn not to participate in someone else's underestimation of ourselves. We adamantly refuse to reject ourselves when we get a rejection. Tough times never last. Tough people always do. Mm-hmm. Contemplate some specific ways you could outlast your next writing defeat. <laughs> then write them down and put them in an easily accessible place. Perhaps you could avoid turning on yourself with negative self-talk, or you might make a special effort to affirm your positive writing qualities. When you encounter no's, you are never really defeated, as long as you use defeat to remember to rise above self-loathing and remember who you are. And then today's takeaway, as you encounter writing defeats, reign victorious by being true to yourself, learn what you can rise from, and never participate in someone else's underestimation of your ability. Mm. That's uh, (laughs) actually the uh, signpost of a resilient writer, is a lot of us, if we make a mistake or if we get rejected, we kick ourselves when we're down. And the key is to, um, actually self-compassion is a wonderful tool, is to put our arm around ourselves and talk ourselves off the ledge and give ourselves pep talks. And what we know is that when we use self-compassion instead of instead of self-loathing, we get back in the saddle and we're able to keep going. 
And that's Brian Robinson reading from Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Was it hard to come up with 365 separate topics? Actually, no. <laughs> um, you know, I started writing from my own experience, and uh, it, it just flew out of me. And, you know, a lot of writers say this, and probably a lot of listeners have experienced this, there comes a point where it just keeps coming. And I, I, like one day I was in the supermarket and I bought about $20 worth of groceries and the cashier looked up and said, that'll be $130.45, something like that. I said, what? And I looked and the woman behind me had not put the stick on the conveyor belt. <laughs> 20 minutes, cleaning up that mess. <laughs> and instead of being upset, I remember, I thought, this is perfect. I'm going to use this. This is how a couple, actually in my novel, this is how they're going to meet. Oh, that's great. That's great. But yeah. You know what? So when you take a bad situation, at least what we consider a bad situation, and you turn it around and you say, okay, how can I make this work? It, I was so excited inside. Instead of being angry or frustrated, I couldn't wait to get home and pound out that scene. Because, I mean, there it was. And I have readings about that, you know, when life, and it sounds trite, but when life gives us lemons, make it lemonade. Uh, and if we think about that as writers, we can use a lot of these uh, unfortunate experiences in, the, in our writing, and that turns it around, and, and we feel so much better uh, instead of feeling, you know, um, victims of the situation it again puts us in the driver's seat and makes us feel empowered and everything is um material for a writer right it can be but that's a mindset you know that's uh if you're if we're willing to look at it it really keeps our head above the water so we don't go under that if if we consider everything that happens uh, it can be um, material for us now, somewhere in here... It's a positive way of, of looking at life. I saw a quote, I can't remember who it was by, but that sort of talked about how you can't have the happy without the sad. You have to have both sides. That's right, and that's one of the, again, one of the meditations in my book. You can't have success without failure. It's, it's, it's impossible. You can't have the dark without the light. Um, so when we when we... If, if I want to, if I want to be a successful writer, I have to accept the rejection. If I want to be uh, a, a published author, I have to accept the fact that it's going to take time to get there, and I have to accept the the times when when I you know when I'm not able to get there. And what that does, it keeps us uh, from the lows are not as low if. if if we're able to do that, if we're able to say, okay, the, the rejection, that's just part of the deal. Like you said before, it's a package deal. I knew it was going to happen. Here it is. So let's keep going. Let's revise it or let's go in another direction or let's go around it and submit it somewhere else. That's what keeps us resilient. That's, that's how we, the grass grows through concrete. And I think, I think maybe you say this on one of, in one of these, that every rejection gets you one step closer to the acceptance. Right, and, you know, that reminds me of a, a quote by um, uh, Babe Ruth, who's one of the greatest baseball players ever. He said, every time I strike out, it brings me closer to the next home run. <laughs> and if we make that for writers, every time we get a rejection, it just brings us closer to our next acceptance. That is the mindset, though, that undergirds our success. Uh, Meryl Streep has it with acting. Billie Jean King had it with tennis. Michael Phelps had it with with uh, swimming, and uh, of course Babe Ruth had it in baseball. It we call it a growth mindset in psychology, and this is something that's being taught more and more in, in public schools with young children. It's how to take the seat and make it work for you instead of throwing the towel in. It's taking that towel you want to throw in and wiping the sweat off your face and keep on going. But the growth mindset is uh, really the sign of, of a successful writer. And the, the people that we love to read didn't just get there overnight. 
And they didn't just get there because they're good writers. They got there because they didn't give up. Well, I love that phrase that you just used or that metaphor about take the towel you want to throw in and um, use it to wipe the sweat yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. Was that something I'm that, that I, uh, I'm guessing you didn't just make that up just now that you've that you've uh, written that before? I probably have. I know I've said it before. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever. Yeah, I think I may have written it. Too. <laughs> well, Brian, why don't you read a couple more of the uh, daily inspirations for us? Okay, do you have one? When is your birthday? December 19th. Okay, let's see what that is. Oh, and while you're looking for that, I found the the quote about uh, from Harlan Coben, who's a um, suspense oh, yeah. writer. Yeah, on May fifth, you can't have an up without a down, a right without a left, a back without a front, or a happy without a sad. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I love that quote. Yeah. So this is uh, December nineteenth, right? Right. Honor your commitment. If we can't make and keep commitments to ourselves as well as to others, our commitments become meaningless, and that's Stephen Covey. All of us look for meaning and purpose in our writing, and we find it by devoting ourselves to the craft in many different ways, volunteering behind the scenes at a conference, agreeing to speak on a panel at a bookstore, reviewing a manuscript, offering writing tips for an online magazine, serving as a judge on an awards panel, pinning a blurb for someone's book or speaking at a book club. Our commitment starts with calculating if it's possible to agree to a request before committing to it. We think about the required timeline and all that's involved. We ask ourselves if our hearts are really in the commitment. Is it something something meaningful that stirs or moves us enough to honestly devote ourselves to, or are we succumbing to pressure or appeasement? When we make a writing commitment, our integrity is on the line. Let's ask how we truly want to devote ourselves to writing, then put our hearts and souls into the promises we make. Or if after consideration we can't make a meaningful commitment, let's give ourselves permission to say no and feel good about the decision. And today's takeaway for December 19th, before you put your heart and soul into a writing commitment, make sure it has meaning and purpose and that you have the time to follow through with your commitment. Mm -hmm. Again, that's Brian Robinson reading from Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Stephen Covey was a guest on Writer's Voices some years ago, and um, Maya Angelou was also a guest some years ago. So I'm, I should go through sometime and, and count how many of your quotes came from writers that I've interviewed. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and there are all kinds of writers in the book. Of course, they're novelists, poets. Uh, Alanis Morissette, uh, the singer-songwriter, has a quote in here. Uh, Louise Penny, um, the psychologist Richard Russo, Winston Churchill, politician. Uh, of course, Ernest Hemingway. Um, well, some of those I wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk with, for sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> they were so wise. But what I learned uh, in writing this book, one of the things that I learned so much... Uh, how wise writers are. I mean, they're wonderful psychologists. The, the the things that, the quotes that I read were just so, just insightful. Uh, now, did you, did you, like, write your, um, like, a, an inspiration, or, you know, write a day, a daily page, and then go look for the quote that fit, or did you find the quotes and write to fit the quotes? I did both. started off writing the, um, meditation then finding a, a quote that would fit but then sometimes i would find a quote and it would trigger wow what what's the meaning in that for writers uh for you know it could be like a, a politician or it could it could have been someone who was a writer but mainly they were something else like a broadcaster or something so i, I did both but i started off uh, writing the uh the, the reading itself and then graduated to just mixing it up sometimes so, as i said if i would just have an experience and that experience would lead me to try to find a quote to go with it um and how did you go about but, find looking for the quotes well i had a, a compendium of quotes because I, lo I, I love to save quotes 
There are some places online that you can go that has, like if you put in time or uh, hurrying and rushing, uh, and it'll throw some quotes out. And once you flip through them, you can usually find something that will fit with if you've already written a reading for that day. Did you use any Mark Twain quotes? I did. <laughs> Doesn't he have something for just about any topic that you um, would care to write about? <laughs> yeah. I can't remember which ones I used, but I probably used more than one. I, I feel like I probably used at least two. Uh, one of my favorites no. that from Mark Twain is... Um, where he, it's in a letter where he says, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, which is all about the fact that editing is such an important part of writing and yeah. a very time-consuming part. And I'm, I'm, do you have much in the book about the editing process? No, I didn't get too much into that. I, I, I uh, stayed pretty close to, um, you know, the motivation and what gets in the way. Okay. But I didn't get get too much into the details of writing itself, but, but kept more into your outlook and mindset and that kind of thing. Well, some, I've known writers who are really wonderful at writing first drafts, but they don't, but then they, they have a new idea, and so they want to move on to the new idea instead of... Yeah going back and doing the, the necessary rewriting on the original idea. So, yeah. So that requires some motivation, too. Yeah, it does. Whereas for other people, facing the blank page is the hard part, and then once they have the first draft, the rewrites are much more, um, flow yeah. much more easily. I do have a, uh, I have a uh, daily meditation on facing the blank page. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, originally I did, is I had a, an index for writers, too, so that you could look at, say, Mark Twain and then go to the page ah. and see one of his quotes. And, um, but the publisher said they didn't think that was necessary and it made it longer than it needed to be, so they took that out. Oh, I would have liked that, I think. I know. I, <laughs> as, you, as we're talking about it, I'm thinking, gosh, I, I kind of wish I'd talked for that. Yeah. Um, did you do the index yourself? I did. You did. So what was, you know, how was the process of doing that? What was that like? Did through, you... I just started at the beginning, and um, I think the <laughs> first thing is about, you know, looking at the future or something like that. And I, I had certain um, topics, certain key words that I would use and just see where each reading fit the best. And sometimes, you know, a reading would fit in two or three different categories or under two or three different words. Right. So what, um, what's the total number of, of topics in the index? Do you, do you know, just roughly? I don't know, but it's pretty, it's pretty long. <laughs> um, it looks like it's about 10 pages long with, uh, you know, topics like heartbreak is one, holding on, letting go is another one, lighten up. Your literary health. The publisher said, "What is literary health?" And I said, "Well, read one, and you'll see." <laughs> uh, and that's really about, you know, uh, balance and exercise. And I have uh, one reading about uh, chair yoga uh, oh. when you're at your writing station. How to just even while you're writing, uh, or at least looking at, at the screen, there's certain yoga techniques that you can use to, uh, sitting in your chair that really give you energy and help you stretch. Um, then there's, there are things on promotion and uh, how to uh, get your workstation straightened up if it's too much clutter, uh, the importance of that. All right, so there's a couple I'm really curious about looking through here. Fatal Attraction. What's that one about? I don't remember. Let's see. <laughs> what page is that on? That what? is De December 24th. Let's see. Got a mystery here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, remove fatal from your attraction. Let me see what the quote <laughs> is by Gustav Flaubert. Some fatal attraction draws me down into the abysses of thought. 
down into those innermost recesses which never cease to fascinate the strong. And so here's the reading. You want me to read this? Sure, please. Sometimes writing can feel like a fatal attraction that refuses to give us the time of day, yet we can't resist the chase. Like moths to a flame, many writers attest to the irresistible chase for writing success, being seduced and pulled in with false promises of glory, fame, and fortune. Some of us can become so infatuated, we're willing to stop at nothing and do whatever it takes, putting ourselves under intolerable conditions, sort of bowling rabbits to achieve writing success. <laughs> bowling rabbits, if you remember the movie. I do remember the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the desire to succeed can create a greater determination to stalk our prey and steamroll over anything or anyone who stands in our way. In the extreme, the very attraction that draws us to writing ultimately can have fatal consequences. When we're caught in an obsessive-compulsive pattern for writing success, it can lead to the destruction of our reputation or even death, known as karoshi, a Japanese term for death from overwork. There's a difference between healthy determination of our writing goals and a fatal attraction that goes overboard. Let's ask ourselves where our per perseverance needle falls on an outer extreme of the spectrum or somewhere in the middle where balance resides. Hmm. Today's takeaway, instead of being a moth to a flame, regulate your attraction to writing so you can maintain a healthy favorite attraction, not a destructive fatal attraction. Wow. That's important. So literary challenges. What kind of things, we've got three in that category, January 31st, June 30th, September 29th. What kind of things are literary challenges? Well, that could be health. Um, you said January 31st? Yes. Let's see what that one is. Um, oh, I like this one. Um, mm -hmm. Let me read it. It's January 31st, Summon Your Strength. Uh, Carl Sandburg said, let the gentle bush dig its roots deep and spread upward to split the boulder. Mm -hmm. How many of us have allowed self-doubt to plummet us into despair? How often do we put our emotional well-being at the mercy of one unpleasant writing incident instead of master, mustering the strength to deal with it? In the same way an acorn contains within it a mighty oak, contains deep within us tremendous roots of strength. Are we in touch with those roots? Do we feel like an acorn or a giant oak? Do we recognize and nurture our strength so it can sprout into stamina, withstand the forces of the literary world? Not just physical strength, but the determination and willpower necessary to withstand daily writing challenges. The kind author and newspaper journalist Judith Forst wrote about, she said, strength is the capacity to break a Hershey bar into four pieces with your bare hands and then eat just one of the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> As writing insecurities try to uproot you, remember that you have everything necessary to keep your feet planted on the ground, that your deep roots cannot be reached by a hard frost. As you harness all the strength within, like the sturdy bush that digs its roots deep, imagine spreading upward and splitting the literary weights that hold you down. Mm. And today's takeaway for January 31st, recognize and summon your inner strength to help you cope with writing uncertainties and resist crumbling under the stressors that accompany your writing journey. So it's a, that's just another reminder that we all have within us a, a, a lot of strength that we may or may not be in touch with. And reading it can kind of help, help meditate on, you know, uh, connecting with that strength within us or that resilient zone that uh, scientists say that we all have. What exactly is a resilient zone? Resilient zone is, uh, it, it's actually, it comes out of uh, neuroscience. And there's something called neuroplasticity that's being talked a lot about nowadays. And, you, you know, we used to have a phrase that you can't teach old dogs new tricks. But we know that's not true, that no matter how old we are, we have the ability to reset our nervous system and change, the, actually, the convolutions in our brain. And we have now the science, the MRIs, to be able to see it. The way that happens is, in a, in a situation, instead of, uh, if, if we have a bad situation, 
or a, a scary situation or an unpleasant situation. Instead of doing what we usually do, and this requires us to stick our neck out a little bit, if we do something different, it creates new neural pathways in our brain. And after a while, it widens the resilient zone. For example, I'll, I'll just give you a very simple example. There are thousands. Um, let's say I get invited to a party, and I don't know one single person at that party. I'm inclined, the first thought I'm going to have is, I'm not going to go to that party because I don't know anybody. Well, if I stick my neck out a little bit and say, well, you know what, I'm going to go and just see what happens. It, chances are, if I do that, I'm going to meet some new people, maybe meet a new friend. I actually, this actually happened to me uh, before I did my first writing group. I didn't want to expose my writing to people back in the day because I didn't feel secure about it. But I, I forced myself, not forced myself, but I stuck my neck out and I went to this writing class. And it was the best thing I ever did. Uh, and what happened was I met three other people, and we did an offshoot of the class, and we became a writing tribe, supporting each other through our, our the novels we were writing. The best thing I ever did. And I thought back, now what if I hadn't stuck my neck out? Then I wouldn't have had those people in my life, and they're still in my life today. Mm-hmm. So we have within us, uh, and scientists call this a negativity bias. And what that means is, we overestimate threats, and we underestimate our ability to handle them. And I write about this, especially for writers. And I'm going to say that again. We overestimate threats, and we underestimate our ability to handle them. That's neuroscience. And that's for survival, so we don't get our heads chopped off in life. The key is to flip that around and overestimate our ability to handle situations and underestimate the threat. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that widens your resilience zone. In other words, you become more resilient, you become more confident, you uh, develop more courage, and you develop that growth mindset that helps you uh, be successful as a writer and possibly even, you know, uh, propel your book to the New York Times bestseller list. Who knows? But it really... Uh, helps you stay in in the game, and uh, it, it's it's the grass that grows through concrete again. Well, it's easier We're looking at the re- the neuroscience of writing and how you tap into that. That's really what the resilient zone is. But how do you flip that overestimation of threats into an underestimation of threats? I mean, do you how do you actually well do that? Step is to, the first step is to kind of think about that. And, and then start to become mindful of a challenge. And notice what your automatic reaction is. That's your sympathetic nervous system or your stress response. And then ask yourself, now wait a minute, maybe, maybe I will do that anyway. You know, as long as it's not, you know, dangerous. We're right, not talking right. about danger. We're talking about psychological safety. Statistics show that we recover quicker from a car crash than a series of psychological defeats. We know that's true. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I think that's pretty <laughs> telling. Uh, and in this field, you've got to be able to recover from defeat and, and rejection. And so you can just start with little things, that, like the party that I mentioned, and uh, stick your neck out and then watch what happens. And it's amazing. I mean, it's something I live by, and I try to practice what I preach. And it's really helped me. Well, actually, the other night, I did a, this book that we're talking about, Daily Writing Resilience. We did a big launch, and I had 110 people. Um, and I was supposed to have Sarah Gruen, who wrote Water for Elephants. She's a friend of mine. She also lives here in Asheville. She was going to interview me instead of me just standing and reading. Mm. Sarah got the flu, and at the last minute, you know, I gulped, but I felt that uh, resilience. I felt the confidence. I, I, it immediately was there. Now, there's been a time in my life when the immediate would have been, that would have been a threat. What am I going to do? Oh, my God, it's a crisis. It wasn't a crisis at all, and everything came out great. Well, that hit, and then also 
we've we've had single digit temperatures here, and my heat went out at home. Oh, my spouse had to stay home and take care of that. So there were a series of things that happened the night of my launch, but you're able to keep your head above water. Uh, and what happens with the resilient zone as you have these challenges that life throws is you start to ask yourself, not if what is life doing to me, what am I doing with what it throws to me? That's really the key. I, pl- I did a little play on words with John Kennedy. Ask not how your writing life is treating you. Ask how you're treating your writing life. <laughs> and what that means is, you know, we're stronger than we think. And if you think that way, you start to feel more confident and empowered and resilient. Wow. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Brian E. Robinson, author of Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Brian, I was going to ask you about these wonderful blurbs that are in your manuscript, the advanced praise for daily writing resilience, one of them being from Sarah Gruen. So you um, kind of explained how you um, got that one. She's a friend of yours, but you, you got great blurbs from so many writers. How do you get those? Well, some of these folks I have known uh, through international thriller writers. I'm a, a member and I've spoken there. And as I said, I was the coordinator of the debut writing uh, writers program. Um, and so, and some of them I didn't know. Some like uh, I met William Kent Kruger, who wrote Ordinary Grace, which is a wonderful book. Uh, at a conference, Killer Nashville in, in Nashville, about two years ago, and I told him what I was up to, and I asked him if he would be willing to look at it, and he agreed to to do it and loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, Cassandra King, who is Pat Conroy's wife, uh, is someone I've known uh, for years, and uh, um, I've spent a lot of time where she and Pat live. Well, Pat, of course, passed away last year, but. Um, on St. Helena Island, South Carolina. That's where I vacation. Um, and some of the other folks, uh, Hank Philippi Ryan and Wendy Tyson, I've been on uh, panels with them uh, at writing conferences. And Karen White, I just loved her work, and I just emailed her mm-hmm. and asked her if she would be willing to you know, write something. And well, let me let me just read aloud one of these from Cassandra King. She writes, You don't have to be a writer to treasure daily writing resilience, a unique and uplifting meditation book. It's chock full of insights so profound you'll be tempted to gobble it up in one bite instead of savoring each daily portion as intended, slowly and appreci- appreciatively. For writers, it's a must-have. And she's also, in addition to being the wife of Pat Conroy, the author of The Sunday Wife and Moonrise. Right. So, uh, the wife was a big hit, um, uh, and Steve Barry uh, uh, also that every page is full of hope and reality. Just what we need to keep us going. Uh, and you know, one of my favorite all-time writers is John Hart. Uh, he uh, writes mystery thrillers, and uh, I just love his writing. And uh, he. Uh, I just sent him an email, and I, I, I hadn't <laughs> and, met him at that point. And he said, well, I can't promise anything, but if you want to send me the, you know, an arc, I'll be happy to take a look at it. And he just raved. He said, I love this book. I love it. He said, I'm going to buy a copy and keep it on my desk. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a highly successful writer, and he has a new book out called The Hush, uh, which I can't wait to get my hands on. It comes out in, I think, two or, two or three months. Well, you seem to be very connected to the literary world, but how did how did you get there? Did you When you first started writing and publishing, was your path to publication thorny? You know, hmm. the first book I ever wrote was with two colleagues. I was at the University of North Carolina. One of them was at the University of South Carolina, and the other was at the University of Georgia. And we wrote a textbook called Child Development Relationships, and we submitted that proposal. This is not typical by any means. We got so many offers from all the top publishing companies. They loved our ideas. It was so innovative and so different. They were sending us flowers and candy and (laughs) stuff to 
New York, and uh, the doorbell was ringing, and, and UPS was bringing us all kinds of stuff. We were really courted, but that is so not typical, and it gave me a little bit of a distortion. Of course, that was an, an academic book, but it gave me a little bit of a distortion of what the real world, literary world is, because after that, uh, it wasn't that way at all. It was much more difficult in getting uh, books, uh, you know, print uh, uh, getting contracts, mm. books. Um, nowadays, that rarely, if ever, happens. Uh, it's very difficult um, because uh, the publishing world, uh, you'll hear no almost every step of the way. And uh, publishers and agents, too, are very uh, picky about, about what they publish. So was it more difficult when you went to publish a novel? Oh, yes. So what was that? Did the fact that you had all these textbooks and you know other and types of nonfiction writing, did that help when you were looking I for a publisher might, for a novel? I think that might have helped some. Um, I, uh, when I was writing self-help books, and I was teaching at the university and also had a private practice at the time when I was writing. I got a call one day and my secretary said, Gloria Steinem is on the phone. And I said, <laughs> what? Gloria Steinem? Uh, and the first thing Gloria said when I picked up the phone, she said, Brian, I feel like I know you. And I said, why? Why do you, well, I know you, but why do you know me? And she had read a little book I wrote. She picked it up in a bookstore. And it was a, a book about workaholism that I wrote uh, back in the 90s. And she wanted to use it in her book, The Revolution Within. And she and I have been communicating off and on ever since. And then one day I got a call from Alanis Morissette, who, and this was more recent, and Alanis and I have become really good friends. And um, in fact, I just did a uh, podcast on her website. She does a, a self help podcast on different uh, psychotherapy and self help kinds of things. And um, she and I have been collaborating and um, are going to be doing some, some projects in the future together. So, you know, over the years as I've been writing, people have just started seeing some of the things I've done, and uh, a lot of people have contacted me uh, and asked me if I would be, you know, be a part of some of the projects that they're doing, which I'm so honored by. Mm. And uh, the fiction uh, area is, is, is very similar in that I've had people starting out to contact me now that I've I've got one novel out there, and the other one is going to be coming out pretty soon. So it's just, uh, as things evolve, they just evolve in ways we never expect, and, and which is the excitement of writing, because you never know what's going to happen with what you write, who's going to read it, if you're going to get an award or, or whatever. It's, but it's all, it, all goes, it all goes back to the love of writing. Well, Brian, we only have about two or three minutes left. Uh, what what is the takeaway for today's interview for writers? What what would you like them to take if you, away? If you're a writer, uh, it, the takeaway is never give up. <laughs> uh, you're gonna you're gonna get no. Uh, you're gonna hit roadblocks. There're gonna be obstacles. There're gonna be hurdles. But you're going through what every writer before you has gone through. Every successful writer. So don't take it personally. And remember, you're on the same path. Just keep going. Mm. Go around it, over it, under it, whatever it takes. Don't give up. Um, and and make sure you have a, a healthy mindset. That's key. How are you looking at what's happening? It's not what's happening to us. It's how we look at it. And how can you reframe it and look at it in a positive way? How can you use that as fuel to get where you want to go? Uh, and for non-writers, uh, you can do that with life. Because life's going to keep throwing us curveballs. That's the nature of life. Life is not to accommodate what we want or what we need. It's for us to adjust to what comes to us and to do that in a positive way mm. and to try to keep a positive attitude. That's the key. Wow. So that's that's a lot. But if you're writing, you you need <laughs> you need to know these things. You need to understand these things. So. Um, Thank you so much for being with us today. 
Brian. I really enjoyed having you on the show. I really highly recommend Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspirations for Writers. Um, I'm going to look for your novel because it sounds like uh, if it's a thriller, it's right up my alley. What's it called? Yeah, it's called Lime, the first one is Limestone Gumption. It's a uh, Brad Pope uh, and Sister Friends mystery. Uh, and it takes place in the underwater caves in North Florida um, where people drown. That's how it begins. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it gets, and it gets uh, scarier from there. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and cu- more curious, who did who did this wow. this person, and why would they do it? Wow! And there's a little club of little ladies too who have a welcome garden as you come into town, and everybody wants to know are their corpses or camellias that they're planting there. So. Ooh. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for bringing us Good daily morning, writing Brian. resilience. Pleasure. And, you know, usually Caroline, we close with, close with a quote from Caroline, and she's not here today, so I'm going to pick one from the book from January 6th, Lee Child, don't be sad that roses have thorns, be glad that thorns have roses. And we'll see you next week on Writer's Voices. And where are we? Okay.